What's next for IT? In today's economy, technology touches every aspect of the day-to-day operations of business. There has never been more pressure on IT to deliver for our organizations. So what can we expect over the next decade? We need to think differently about how we approach our work to continue to thrive into the future. This requires all of us to be intentional in how we look at our role going forward. Smart IT is an approach to getting the important things done by transforming the way we think, work, and lead. And now, let's disrupt the status quo, simplify the complex, and reduce risk the Smart IT way. Hey, Catherine, how's it going there? Hey, William, it is so good to see you. I'm excited to nerd talk with you. Um, as always, we always have the best nerd talk sections. Well, I great, uh, really appreciate you coming on and joining the Smart IT podcast. Uh, we are kind of explore what's next for IT and its professions and all the cool things that's coming up here. So I was thinking about you uh, when I was thinking about guests. I said, you know what? Let's get into this uh, improving our communications, do a little storytelling. I got to talk to you. Absolutely. Well, I'm happy you thought of me. And uh, yeah, the industry is so interesting. Everything happening in, in the, the smart IT world. Obviously, you know all about that, the cybersecurity world and effective communication is a big part of that. Yeah, Everyone's got to be on the same page uh, from leadership, whether it's the finance side or the actual CISO to those in the NOC, uh, to your vendors, like everyone's got to have a clear picture of what's going on if they're going to make it work. So. Well, you know, if you've been around enough IT professionals, one thing that we're not really known well for is communicating in plain English or business language. So we're uh, known to talk uh, in techno babble. Uh, So among ourselves, it works pretty well. uh, But we have to go and talk to the finance department or HR or uh, talk to people who have suits on. uh, We tend to struggle. So I always thought that one of the best things we can do as IT professionals to upskill our, our, our professional development is to start with communications. Like how do we express what was going on currently? And if we need something new or different to be able to express it in a way that people can actually understand. So let's step, take a little step back. And uh, so you've been on this journey here about storytelling. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got into it and what kind of drove this passion of yours? Yeah, absolutely. So I've been writing stories since before I could spell correctly. That's how far back this goes. I just grew up reading. I loved how story could just transport you into another world. You could take on experiences that I had no business having, but because I read, right, I I get to ingest them and make them my own. And um, so obviously I started writing stories because I wanted to have that magic. And it wasn't until... I was maybe 14 years old and I was reading uh, a story from John John Steinbeck, The Winner of Our Discontent. And I think that's really when it hit me how much was going on psychologically. Um, because here I'm reading a book about a man, you know, living in the 50s. He's probably in his 50s, has a family, right? So I'm 14 year old teenager yeah. reading about this man in his 50s. And it's like, how do I even understand what he's going through? You know, I I was getting to experience his life. And that's, uh, so from then on, I was been pretty committed to learning, you know, what actually makes this happen, um, in the mind that we can have different experiences psychologically, emotionally, sometimes even physically, right. You're watching a scary movie or right. Your palms start sweating, your heart starts beating faster. So we even have, um, physiological responses. So studied that. And today fast forward several years, um, I help tech companies use storytelling and other communication tactics because none of us want to leave opportunity or money on the table because someone didn't understand the value we provide. Like it's fine if it's just not a good fit. They're getting their needs met by a team that's very efficient and just a good match for them. But please never let me miss opportunity because someone didn't understand our value. You know, no one wants that. Well, it's interesting you kind of uh, position it that way because in IT, they have to go out and buy a lot of technology, a lot of different vendors and partners to work with. And then uh, when they come into the office and say, hey, we're going to get, going to pitch you on our technology or our new solution. Uh, a lot of times IT can get frustrated because there's a lot of feeds and speeds and knobs and things like that. And they may get it, but then they have X amount of dollars to spend and they go back to their business and says, hey, we need uh, to spend a million dollars on this new tech. 
and it's cool. All right. So both from the vendor talking to the IT and IT talking to the business, it's always a little interesting challenge to say, did the business at the end of the day receive the information they needed to make a decision? Uh, so talk a little bit about making that connection for people who don't, who don't really care about it being cool necessarily, but really kind of compare to like, really can, uh, care about that business impact and why should we care about it? Why should we spend that money? Yeah, absolutely. You make some excellent points about all the different types of audiences you have to talk to and communicate to. And something I want to add on to what you said is, you know, yes, you have IT people talking to finance people or other executive leadership, um, HR maybe even. But even between the IT and the IT people, when you start talking about those speeds and feeds, even they can take a few minutes to be like, why are they telling me this? Like, so even some of the tactics I'm about to share helps in communicating with other people in your own field. Um, you never know when someone's coming from mentally. Maybe they just got off the phone with their spouse and they've been talking about their kids and their mind's in a different place. So if you jump right in to something heavily technical, right, you've kind of lost them and they might not even know if they want to finish the conversation. So, um, so starting with that, my first tip would be pay attention to what matters to your audience. Right. So and and like I said, you also don't know what mental state they're coming into the discussion with. So let's say you're about to give a presentation. Right. You know that other people you don't know what they've been thinking about. They don't you don't know who they've been talking to. So you need to prime them a little bit. Hopefully you've done some of that with an email or some kind of warm up before the meeting. But knowing what they care about. So if you mention like the finance team, what does the finance team care about? might be a slightly different than the IT team, right? IT team might be, yeah, they want to be successful, get nice and weekends back. We hear that a lot, right? Where finance teams more thinking money, right? Yeah. How do I budget this in? So, right, same solution, but speaking from a slightly different angle to these people. The second tip is storytelling. Um, but before you start thinking, I think a lot of people get hung up yeah. on thinking, I need to tell a story. How do I do this? I have all this data I need to explain, blah, blah, blah. And they just kind of overcomplicate it. Simplest thing I can tell you, if you took one thing away from this yeah. podcast today, I would say, just remember, we have a goal. There's a problem. This is our plan of action, the journey. If you can just remember yeah. that sequence, you'll be fine. Goal, problem, plan of action. Okay. So it's not like the... Uh... I T to kind of take a step back and realize if it's, um, for example, uh, the business is caring about reducing expenses. So if we figure out, hey, we did some analysis and found a lot of the expenses are due to one of our internal systems that track maybe um, uh, how we use or re get reimbursed for expenses in the field. Maybe we can, we can buy a new system, a new cloud-based SaaS system that tracks and then makes discounts on some expenses like hoteling and lodging but it has an X amount of dollars to it. So it's interesting that you can almost back into it and say, we have this new cool tech, it's SaaS based, it's cloud, here are the security requirements, it costs X amount of dollars. So it's not like we could actually use that story to back into it and say, at the end of the day, we're spending this amount of money because we're going to do spence, business expenses and this is kind of how we're going to do it. And I'm kind of getting a feel for that uh, correctly. Correct. Or tweaking that a little bit. And for everyone listening, I mean, this is my job and I still draft. I think if some people saw my first drafts yeah. of things, they'd be like, she does this for work. Like people pay her yeah. money for this. Yeah. So don't, don't let that hang you up and get you frustrated. It's going to take multiple revisions and practice, especially for those presentations, but maybe saying in this case, you're wanting to switch out technology. Um, because of some inefficiency that's that's costing money, it doesn't need to say, guess what? We found an opportunity where we could save X amount of dollars over this many years. That's our goal, right? Oh, yeah. Now we'll transition to the problem. See, the problem is we've had this system that is draining you know, money that it doesn't need to for whatever efficiency, keep it short. Yeah. Here's our plan of action. We want to require this. Yes, it costs us X, but over X amount of years, will actually have saved this. And you can also add in a few other benefits as well. Um, and on your point about, you know, this may have taken a lot of research on the team, a lot of digging into yeah. data, a lot of analysis. You can mention like one to three or four um, data sets you looked at just to let them know you did your due diligence. 
But something that's really helpful is having kind of almost like a playbook. You know, you have your executive summary and then almost a report of everything you did and let them know that right then and there say, you know, we've done this analysis, you know, through X, Y, Z and several more. We have it all documented here. You know, you feel free to ask questions, but we're also handing these out so you can do a deeper analysis yourself to see how we came to this conclusion. So it sounds like this is going to be kind of a new skill set for a lot of people because normally once they do the analysis, um, they crunch the numbers, they'll pick, they'll go from Excel, they'll paste the numbers into a, a, a PowerPoint presentation, which might be a hundred slides. And it's a whole bunch of data, like a data dump almost. And they're almost anticipating that by going through a hundred slides, the audience is going to pick up on this. So I think for a lot of people, they're thinking they should get it right. I, I showed them all my work, all my due diligence, a lot of number crunches. They should get it right. So they hit slide number hundred. And then the audience looked like we have no idea what you're talking about. Talk a little bit about that mindset of it could, it, I, I could have been only five slides if you use a narrative or a story to get the point across. So talk a little bit about that, that transition, like the, from a hundred slides, sending it over to somebody or just powering through it versus let's craft a narrative that takes them from what, what the current state looks like, what's the insights they found. And then, okay, here's a, a outcome that's more positive from a, where we currently sit. So you talk a little bit uh, about that. Yeah, absolutely. Death by PowerPoint, right? Um, (laughs) Do not have a hundred slides in your PowerPoint. Um, Save that for the report that they want to look through, you know, the other leadership, whoever uh, is a decision maker in this, they can look through it if you want, but also know your information. So we'll see a lot of times in executive meetings, they'll interrupt you and they'll ask if they want to know something. (laughs) So have it top of mind, um, but don't, like you said, go through all those slides. Remember that framework, that really simple framework I shared. You know, what's our goal, problem, plan of action? Think of your presentation in that manner. Um, as few words as possible, use images. And then that heavy data, like in your report, because you can refer back to it. They can, but they're not, you know, you'll be lucky mm-hmm. to get 15 minutes. Right. They might slot 30 minutes, but you need to, the rule of thumb is leave like 15 minutes for questions and might even cut the meeting early, but they'll ask what they want to know. And it's uh, what's interesting is that just the 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 variety of the types of communication that go on inside of every business and obviously inside of IT. So sometimes it could be a status update uh, on the project. It could be a request for a new budget. It could be a team update. Uh, so I think everybody thinks of the story as this one big thing you do for like a big once a year thing as opposed to day to day. So talk a little bit about like one team in IT talking to another IT team for that 30 minute update that says, hey, maybe we're going off uh, off track here. Maybe we're behind schedule. Talk a little about applying that story and narrative to that type of for- communication format. Really good example there, because in these situations, these teams are probably talking more often than in our previous example, you know, meeting with the executive team to ask a big ask, a big monetary ask. So if two different IT teams, you know, or technology teams are working together on a project, they're probably communicating more often than not. And ideally those people would come prepared to the meeting. Like this is what we talked about last time. I have my updates prepared, so on. So when you do start that meeting, people should be more in the mindset of what we're going to talk about then say presentation mode to executive leadership. So in those situations, it is easier to kind of jump right in, you know, Hey, if I'm leading this type of meeting, remember, this is our goal. Um, let's discuss any problems or roadblocks we've had and what our next steps are, where are we at? So it kind of still follows that same path. I think it is important to remind our teams of the, the big vision. Cause sometimes when we get so deep in the weeds, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's easy to get hung up on this one little feature, this one little thing, but what is the, the end goal, you know, that big vision and keep working towards that. Yeah. Cause a lot of times our team, there's just a little bit of inspiration from management or the leadership team that say, Hey, uh, maybe uh, we threw you a curveball. We gave you six weeks to uh, develop this new application. Uh, by the way, you now have four, four weeks. Uh, so it's like it might be an opportunity to, to do a little inspirational storytelling there just to kind of reset expectations that there's less time now. 
or might require you to do spend more hours working on this it might be harder. So talk a little bit about it, just kind of get uh, resetting the expectations and get anybody as a team all together on that one commonality. It's like, it's going to get harder, but it's going to be worth it at the end. Yeah, that's a hard one because at the end of the day, no one wants to lose sleep or time with friends and family. So yeah, I would say having that end goal and knowing there is an end date to this. So motivational speeches can be a little harder, but again, knowing what, what is motivating people behind this? Like, why should they be excited about what we're doing and that we are going to get over this? This is temporary. Um, and so I would align just that reminder. It doesn't necessarily have to follow a story, but reminding them, you know, a few weeks into this, you know, we're going to have a great product because we're all working so hard. We're going to get our friends and family together. We're going to have those nights and weekends back. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm thinking about the, the, the hero's journey and it almost yeah. fits perfectly for us. Like we want an exciting movie, right? It wouldn't start off easy and say, we're on schedule. We got all the resources we need. Everything's going well. Update's done. So when it's like bumpy, it's like, I said, oh, I'm thinking about hero's journey now. Something right. goes wrong. Something unexpected happens. Uh, things aren't where they should be. And all of a sudden, you, you almost gird the team for like, it's, it might look dark and, uh, and down now, but there's going to be a comeback. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. Let's, you know, almost rah around the crowd like there's a way out of this. We just keep pers um, persisting, 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 and we'll get there. And, and it not, happens a lot when, like, get a budget cut or you lose some resources. Uh, all of a sudden, you got to do a little bit more or do it differently than you expected. I was always found uh, in my mind, I thought, hey, this sounds like a great, great movie, right? And if I'm starring this, like, okay, at the end, I'm going to tell everybody these are all the things we overcame to actually get to that finish line. Absolutely. And you bring up so many good points and I would add the empathy. So if I'm the project team lead and I'm the one breaking the news, mm -hmm. you know, we had six weeks, we're now to four and they still want all the features and everything that was in the original plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Having that empathy, because mm -hmm. I think we've all been in the situation where we're going through a hard time and someone just says, well, keep your chin up, you know, and they give up and it's almost insulting. Like you need that, you know, that empathy and as the project team lead, other team members being vulnerable, like, you know, I'm not happy about this either, um, but we are going to persevere. We're going to be there for each other. We'll have a little dinner party or something <laughs> when we make it through this. And like you said, you know, the, it is those moments that make us better. Um, those hard times, we become more innovative and creative because we have to, right? We're at that point where those home stretches. I think it's also important while we're talking about this is, yeah, we can talk to our team and say, these are the new perimeters of our project, but you know, really talking to leadership and asking why are they making these decisions? Because you use the narrative as well mm -hmm. to say, is this really worth it just to get to market faster? You know, and explaining these are the the cons of doing yeah. this as well and, and making sure, you know, maybe they're just wanting to do that just to have numbers that look better. We did it yeah. in four weeks instead of six, yes. but is it really worth it? So you can, you can talk back a little. I, well, I don't want to use the word talk back, but, you know, communicate, make sure yes. it's really in their best interest. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to my clients, I, I remind them I'm first and foremost a consultant. And so there's going to be things that I tell you that you don't have to take that advice or those recommendations, but I do see it as my job to let you know all the pros and cons of the decisions we're discussing. And so you can feel good about the decision you ultimately make and we'll go with whatever you decide. Nice, nice. Right. So that's a lot of the internal aspects of IT. Uh, so I think we touched upon it at the beginning of the conversation about the external forces. So IT having to deal with a lot of uh, third parties, a lot of partners, a lot of vendors, a lot of integrators. And uh, I know you focus on that on that side of the house where the integrators and partners and manufacturers are struggling to get their message across to IT. So kind of fighting in the crowded space to get their message across like, we had the best service or we had the best tech or the best experience. Um, what does IT have to look forward to the next decade from the, from the, vent, at the external uh, side of the house when those uh, external sources start to leverage more uh, narratives and, and more storytelling? Well, you're right. It's really competitive out there. I mean, 
the joke is that you could take copy from company A and give it to someone, just take out their branded name and people could think it's company A, B, C, D, all the way to Z (laughs) because all of it sounds so much the same, you know, delivering the best experience across security automation, (laughs) threat prevention. I mean, they're, they're all using the same words. And so it's kind of no wonder it's hard to get meetings uh, because they see that copy or they hear those words and like, well, I already have that. (laughs) You know, do I really want to switch vendors? Do I really want to do this? So I do see that people are going to have to start getting more creative. Um, People are tired of the same boring ads, getting the same voicemails, the same emails from people. Um, Something, you know, you and I, William, have talked about is using more creative storytelling, maybe even that feels more like fiction, right? So maybe it's a video where you're actually playing out the problems that your audience is going through, making it feel like a movie trailer or something, but really it is an ad introducing your services or your product, but showing it in action, not just a bunch of buzzwords with cool technology in the background. (laughs) So that's where I do see the market going is it's, People are going to have to have more fun and creativity and uniqueness and authenticity in their messaging because it's just all sounding the same and people are bored and tired of it. Yeah, I know a lot of chief information officers would love to have a a different approach, uh, especially when they get inundated, maybe with 20, 30, 40 emails, 20 phone calls, people hitting them up on LinkedIn about the, the new thing that could turn their company around. So that sounds interesting that they, they could almost look forward to maybe more innovation on the uh, vendor and manufacturer side. Uh, Cause they definitely are looking forward to something different. Absolutely. And then the, the examples I just gave, you know, like a video that feels more like a movie trailer, you know, showing their product or service in action and solving those problems. You also understand what that product or solution set does faster. Because again, you think about, I have a goal, there's a problem. This is a plan of action to fix it. Notice we keep going back to this very yeah. simple general framework. It's the same thing. So they're going to, one, they're going to be engaged because they're not seeing or hearing this type of creative messaging, right? From everyone else. It stands out. It's unique. It's fun, but they're also going to understand the value way faster. Um, and that way, I also think we're going to see more of a decline in your typical sales conversations. I think they are going to sound more of a consultant driven type of conversation, just nerd talking. I've seen a lot of my clients and myself as well, gay new business, not from trying to sell, but from literally just nerding out over this yeah. stuff together, right? It opens that trust. It's it's more fun and you don't have that pressure of, oh, they're just trying to sell me this thing. No one likes that. I know, especially when it's not like the old days, it might've been one or two key people making that decision. Now it's a broad... Um, Diverse groups. So it could be the chief information officer. It could be somebody in procurement, uh, somebody on the development team, somebody in security. You could actually have 10, 15, 20 people inside the organization that have to hear some form of this presentation or pitch from the, uh, from the uh, solution provider or vendor. So it sounds like there may be a, a way to weed these different elements together. <clears throat> it's not like story the perfect format to actually get this message across a diverse number of personas as we like to call it, um, different goals, different objectives. But at the end of the day, we still want to uh, uh, provide for the business. Absolutely. Because if you think of like stories in movies or the books we read, right, even if they're fiction, but that's what most a lot of people watch documentaries or just fiction. That's right. We have all these different characters with all these different end goals, but sometimes they have to come together because they have a common enemy, you know, or common goal to achieve. And so they all come and work together. It's the same thing in businesses and business ecosystems. So when you start framing that in stories, it shows all those different elements at work together. I have worked on some projects. Um, Actually, one of my most challenging presentations was just as what you described is the client of mine had, they were within the final rounds of this RFP process um, they were against three other vendors um, for this huge innovational project for an airport. And, but they're like, but we have to talk to five different groups, yeah. <laughs> you know, that nice. all will use this, this technology, but in different ways. How do we talk to them all? And I had a couple of ways I could have done this. 
I could have made one long narrative um, that included all these groups together. I decided against that because of the format. Now, I would have gone that way if we were advertising to them in a way where, hey, maybe I want them to watch a, a series of videos, right? So it feels like entertainment. They're walking it through, but it's really ads. Yeah. <laughs> I could have done something like that. But I was like, for this presentation that's going to be sent, that, and this was during um, the pandemic times when, so yeah. they weren't even going to get to meet with them in person. This was more like make a deck and send it over. Oh, wow. that, they didn't even get to see them in person. So it was such a hard project. What I ended up doing is taking splices of what the story would have been into the presentation. So this is what how it would have affected this one department. And I just chose one scene that again follows this is the goal, the problem, the plan of action. And did that for each department. So it was like you could almost see scenes of a story that fit together. And it worked very well, especially given that in this scenario, the the prospective client was going to be reading the presentation. Yeah. Uh, and so that worked. It actually worked really well. Well, that could be uh, very valuable. Can you think about ex every extra day the IT spends in the procurement process, trying to find new technology, find new integrators. If you can just shorten that whole sales process and procurement process and discovery process. And if, if the providers are doing that on their side of the house, that become very valuable for IT because once again, they can get new tech, new capabilities in house faster, right? And that's what the business is asking for. Faster capabilities, faster time to market. And so many of the business initiatives are tied to technology. And if you acquire more and more of your technologies outside your four walls, then anytime you can actually shorten that is very, very critical. So I find this very fascinating and valuable for IT going forward is develop, work with more partners, and more vendors who can kind of shorten that cycle. And if storytelling is that vehicle, I think that's uh, that's pretty powerful there. Exactly. Helping people understand it faster. Um, but also, I mean, from a sales perspective, even that shortens your sales process, which is where you're going at with this. So not only the procurement, but from the sales side, you know, is this person not responding because they find my emails and voicemails boring and they don't get it? Like, no, I want that response immediately because either yes, they're interested or no, they're not. And now I know I can keep moving on to the next prospect or with this specific prospect, they are interested. Okay, let's get to the next step. Who do we need to meet with? Who do we need to talk? What do you need to see? Let me show you how it's worked for other companies. You know the, you know the process, but you get there faster. So all the way from the sales to the implementation should be happening faster if you are effectively communicating across all your teams and departments. Yeah, because it was like a team of teams. It's all the internal teams, all the external teams, and just trying to manage this whole ecosystem of different players has always been challenging. So I keep saying the CIO got more and more pressure uh, on his or her shoulders to figure out how to keep this up and more distinguished. Can I do a smaller number of partners who are more impactful so it's not like maybe if they're doing a uh, storytelling, it's one way to become more impactful, faster, quicker, show the value. And if you can help on external side, speed up my internal processes, that really makes a difference. So I'm going to make an IT a lot more, more smarter and uh, nimbler in the future. So that's uh, very interesting. Well, and what you touch on, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, mm -hmm. but the innovation side. And so once you start talking in stories and possibilities, it helps you also narrow down what you really want to do, right? Um, so instead of just sticking in the technology capability, when your partners and other vendors and use the business yourself start coming in and talking in stories as far as vision, right? You can really go far away than when you had just kept in more technology capability discussions. Yeah, I see that a lot in uh, like user experience, UX, uh, human-centered design where all of a sudden it's not about the experience both internally and externally. So it's kind of fast to just figure out, okay, if I want to compare three or four different experiences, how do I describe that? So it's very yes. technical. It's like not as useful. If you can describe it in a story format, what did the customer journey look like when they engage our company from start to finish? Let's see option A versus option B, a different experience. It seems like there's a lot of... um opportunity for a story to be used to talk about that experience and the choices that you can present back to uh, IT and the digital transformation initiatives, which 
flow back up to business transformation. So can, can you talk a little bit about ex, exploring the different experiences through story? Absolutely. Um, and in fact, I'll answer that yeah. with a story. Okay. How about that? Okay, there we go. <laughs> okay. So uh, I actually worked for several clients that asked this question. And the one example I can give is I started working with this client who, like most of us, they make a lot of presentations, uh, a lot of visual assets, including one pager. So if you go to an event, right, and you want to hand out something, have it on the booth and have a conversation around it, what do you do? Well, when I start working with them, a lot of their one pager content, same with presentations, but we'll stick to the one pagers, okay. was a lot of text and the visuals they did have really just show technology connecting. <laughs> you know, okay. it, it was like boxes of switches connected to this or that or that, right? And so what we did to talk about the experience was we, we pulled it out. So instead of just looking down at the technology and how it's all connected and where data is flowing and where it's being secured, yeah. we took it out and we started showing graphics of a person sitting behind a screen, all the screens that they were having to manage and what was going on literally from the person managing this technology's experience and how they're getting calls from other departments. Why is this not working? Why is this down? Right. So you could start the conversation more around the problem and what the end goal was, right? What our goal is, and then talk, de talk deeper about the technology. So the little bit of text we did have yeah. was more about this is the solution that can fix what's described That's in the it. picture. But when you first see that graphic, you identify with it because you're immediately, you know, just within a few seconds, like, oh, this is my life. Yeah. And it really stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Someone could fix this for me. Yes. <laughs> you know, that would just make my life so much better. And so that client did report after using these types of graphics and one pagers that starting conversations was far easier and far more impactful um, and valuable. And that it was much easier to get contact information and set up an actual meeting, you know, later in the day. Yeah. Yeah, so that, so, that's mm. focusing on that experience through story and, and showing the problem, not just the technology and how it's connecting together. That got me thinking now, imagining the, the diagram of all the technology in the background that Amazon uh, use c compared to the story of a person picking up their smartphone, clicking a button, and then boom, the next day there's something, a box being delivered to their house. Exactly. Yeah, That's a yeah. perfect example. Yeah. Exactly. Of, of just simplifying it to that user experience. Yeah. And you can almost use it in a competitive standpoint too. businesses say, right, here's our story of that one button. And then the next story is the one where you got to get on the phone, got to go to three websites, got to log in, got to do all this extra stuff. So it's like a very powerful uh, methodology from a competitive standpoint for business marketing to use from uh, in the marketplace to distinguish themselves. So it's like a quite a wide variety of uh, use cases here for where you could use story. Oh, absolutely. Another strong one is between the IT teams and the marketing teams, because how often do we see that disconnect between yeah. what our solution does and these engineering people are trying to explain what their technology does, but a lot of these marketing people are not engineers. They don't have an IT background yeah. except for helping market the IT. Yes. You know, I don't have an engineering background. Um, and so what I found and others will also find is when you start talking in stories, it's almost like a language translator. Yeah. Um, you know, so imagine you speak German and I speak English. Yeah. We're not communicating, but you start talk with one of you starts talking in stories. You'll notice the other one, their natural inclination is to come back with a story or add on to your story or correct your story. One example is a lot of times I don't really understand what someone is explaining to me because of the engineering background change and they're not, they're talking tech speak. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'll say, so you mean it works like this and I'll give a user experience story and I know I'm wrong, but now because okay. I've started talking in story, the engineer will be like, no, 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 it goes like this, but see, he'll tell it back to me in the correct story form. Okay. So I've kind of led the way I've given an example of how I want to consume his knowledge or her knowledge. And then they repeat it back correctly. That's, that's fascinating. You're almost, you're changing, uh, improving the communication channel and methodology and approach. Uh, mm -hmm. cause a lot of times it's like the, the tech, uh, battle went out. You might have got a head nod and it's like, no, no, they didn't receive that at all. Like 90% of what we just said, they have no idea what that means or what that is, but the ability to actually switch it and say, I'm a, I'm gonna communicate this differently here. 
let's see if you can, you can get the main thrust of it. That That's pretty powerful. It's very powerful. And uh, hopefully if you're, you know, in the situation where you are video call or in person, you'll see that look in their face, that kind of deer in headlights, like kind of spaced out, like they're trying to follow, but they're not. And so just even paying attention to those social cues will help you know, okay, I need to, I've gone too far down the tech side without <laughs> enough context. Yeah. You know, let's bring it back a little bit. Um, hopefully those people would feel comfortable asking questions, but we know some, some people don't, they just assume they're getting it or they're just, they're like, I'll figure it out later. So if you can read yes. those social cues and go yeah. ahead and just <laughs> add more context, that'll be helpful. Well, one area that every IT professional struggles with is letting their family members know, like mom and dad, what they do for a living. So most parents are like looking at like you're you're talking, you're saying stuff, uh, data center, cloud, BYOB, uh, or BYOD, uh, CASB. It's like it's a lot of acronyms, and then you're saying digital transformation, business initiative. Even that language is kind of murky. And at the end of the conversation, mom and dad still have no idea what you do. But they do know when you come to visit the house, you're the tech person who can fix the computer and the printer. <laughs> right. No. And you know, you bring up such a good point is because we talked a lot about story, but story is just one tool in the toolbox. I mean, it's very versatile, so you can use it in a lot of situations or even just taking its structure, right. To, to explain something, but there's also analogies, there's metaphors. I just was explaining to my parents, they were uh, a little confused on how an IT solution provider was different from like the cybersecurity manufacturers. Like where does that cross over? And yeah. I gave the example of Best Buy. Well, an IT solution provider is kind of like Best Buy. You can go and you can buy all these different types of electronics. They're not all from the same brand or vendor, yeah. right? Compared to the actual manufacturer only sells their stuff. They're only proficient in their products. And they're like, oh, okay. And they're yeah. like, they totally got it. So you, you can make it relatable to what that person is already familiar with through an analogy or metaphor, and they'll they'll pick it up really quickly. So it sounds like we may have a great forum for IT professionals to practice better communication skills with non-technical people when they go home or just uh, visit yeah. family members. Right. If you can explain it to family members that are in totally different fields than you, you know, and are not familiar at all with the tech space, if you can get them to understand, surely you can get your company's executive leadership, <laughs> right? Or other yeah. people in the company to get it. So great practice. Another great practice. And this is actually fun homework for people. I think all of this is fun, uh, but yeah. is watch movies, watch really good movies or series because what we're talking about, the structure, it's around us everywhere. I think people just get hung up on how do I apply that to business? How do I apply that to technology? But once you just see the pattern over and over again, okay, here's a person or hero or character with a goal. Here's the problems they're over, you know, that they're coming across. That's the plan of action. A lot of times it repeats, right? Usually our protagonist doesn't just overcome one problem. There's usually three to 10 yeah. <laughs> in a movie, but you start getting familiar with that pattern and seeing it, you know, then when you come into the office, just apply that same, that same structure, that same pacing to, um, and to your communications. I like this. We got some homework to become more, more smart IT, uh, like versus traditional IT is to go home this weekend and introduce a new concept and, uh, help your parents realize the cloud computing Still is sitting this out of a data center. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Watch some movies and have fun with it. Um, yeah. And also notice back on the homework of, you know, talking with family, yeah. seeing if you can get them to get it and just watching yeah. movies. Again, watch the good ones. But if you notice yourself getting bored in a movie, look at the time. Um, how far into the movie are you? You'll notice that most people, we have very short attention spans. And so in the best sh movies, in the best series, yeah. you'll notice them introducing the problem or the conflict, the plot starting earlier and earlier in the, in the show. And your communication needs to be the same way. Don't bury the information, what you're trying to solve with too much backstory, right? That gets boring. Oh, okay. People are like, why are okay. they telling us this? So yeah. when you're watching your movies and your series, notice that, you know, 
why am I getting bored? Oh, look, they waited 30 minutes into the movie to get to what the plot is. That's why. <laughs> they were working on the director's cut. And it's a three and a half yes. hour movie. Like, what's all this extra stuff here? Let's do that in there. Right. Exactly. So. I'm always looking for, okay, the director and the writer put this scene in specifically to know we're coming back to this planet later on to that village and it's going to connect to the end. And then we get to the end and realize it doesn't connect. It's like that should have been cut. It should have never made it to the screen. Yes. And they left a major plot hole in it, which again, you don't want plot holes in your presentations or communications either. A plot hole is when things don't line up. Right. So another thing you can learn from the movie industry is how to tie those up. Um, so nothing seems missing, even though, like we mentioned earlier in our very first example of presentations and having your deck of, or not deck, really report of all the data you have and the analysis you've done, you know, can refer to it, but you don't want to leave anything glaringly left out uh, when you're actually communicating. I think that's a great uh, lesson for IT. Um, we have a lot of digital transformation projects or initiatives that fail. So a lot of time and investment, a lot of analysis about what's about to happen. And at the end of the day, it's like we didn't take the, our culture into account. We didn't take our, our way we operate into account. We had a lot of cool tech, had a lot of meetings, a lot of time, a lot of effort. But at the end, it's like, okay, this really didn't do anything for us. And it's like, ha, huh, what story were we trying to tell in the first place when we undertook this? Uh, so I think it's kind of a good time. Good learning experience for IT for everything they do to be able to explain why they're doing what they do and communicate what they're doing and providing value back to the business. That's such an excellent point because you're right. So many projects don't go as planned and might be even seen as a failure. I'm doing quote fingers for those yeah. who are only listening. <laughs> but that's when you can also turn the narrative around and say, this was our expected outcome. It didn't happen like that, but here is what we did learn from it. So you should still get value from that experience. Um, and how your lessons from that experience can make other projects successful because of, again, what was learned. So twist that narrative a little bit so it doesn't yeah. sound like a total failure. No, we did get value from this. It wasn't what was completely expected, but it was still yeah. a valuable experience. Well, this is, we could go on for hours on, on this topic. Isn't it fun? Stories, fine? allergies, metaphors. <laughs> Uh, making sure what we're communicating, attend to communicate is actually getting across. Yes. Um, I think this has been kind of a great, uh, great start here, uh, for all the millions of IT professionals out there. Kind of a good way to start to think about when they up level their professional skill set and communications, that there are, there are more options out there, ways to uh, improve what they're doing and, and communicating what that is and just helping the business out more. So I greatly appreciate your time today, Catherine. Yeah, this is really fun. And I thank you for having me on the Smart IT yeah. Podcast. Uh, always enjoying your talking with you. And I hope people ask questions. If you're listening to this, you know, where where would people submit questions to William if they they wanted to know more? Oh, okay. my website, uh, WilliamReed.info. They can definitely leave me a message there. Well, I want to thank everybody for spending time with us today. Uh, this has been the Smart IT Podcast. We will see you on the next episode. Thanks for joining another episode of the Smart IT Podcast, where we explore what's next for IT and disrupt the status quo, simplify the complex, and reduce risk together. If you like what you hear, please like, subscribe, and leave your comments. And for more Smart IT wisdom, check out my website at williamreed.info.